Well, good evening. Welcome along. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen and special guests, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Great Hall of Parliament House, the People's House, for the 2015 Constitution Day Speakers Forum. I'm Paul Barclay from ABC RN's Big Ideas. Tonight we are talking about the Australian Constitution and about constitutional issues with a particular focus on Magna Carta. Um, Magna Carta may be 800 years old and the Australian Constitution barely 100, but the more venerable document can help us look at the paperwork of our national democracy in a new light. We are still talking about Magna Carta despite its great age. It remains relevant to our evolving democracy and we'll talk about the ways in which it is still relevant shortly. It reminds us that the Australian Constitution is also a living document and if you need any proof of that, consider the historic summit earlier this week about the recognition in the Constitution for first Australians. This Constitution Day Speakers Forum is being filmed and webcast as we speak and will be broadcast on Big Ideas on Monday the 20th of July on RN and will be available for downloading and podcasting from the RN website at abc.net.au slash RN. I also invite you to join the conversation on Twitter and uh, take note of this hashtag, hashtag C underscore day 2015. That is C underscore day 2015. It will be terrific for you actually to tweet some questions throughout the proceedings tonight. In previous similar forums to this, some great questions have come from the audience and from the Twitterverse and I've been able to put them to the panel and I hope to do so again tonight. But first of all, before we go any further, I'd like to invite Numri custodian Paul House to perform a welcome to country. Paul is a family man, knowledge holder and custodian of culture, heritage, stories and country. Paul has multiple Aboriginal ancestries and identifies as a descendant of Numri Walgalu man Henry Black Harry Williams. He is the son of Numri Nunawal elder and activist Matilda House and was born in the centre of his ancestral country at the old Canberra Hospital in 1969. Paul is a Justice of the Peace and a member of the Numri Local Aboriginal Land Council. He began his public service career in the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs in 1989 and currently works for the New South Wales Government. Please join me in welcoming Paul House. Thank you. Yuriya Marang, Yilangalang Bu, Gibabango Wogabu, Migay Bu, Dera Nilbang Mayini. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, young men and young women, distinguished guests. Yadi Injamali, Nyambri, Gumal Wogalu, Wallabaloa, Nanawal, Mujigang, Yanangbu, Jandu. My respects to Nyambri, Gumal, Wogalu, Wallabaloa. Elders past and present. Yadi in Jamarabu, Mujigangu, Nurumbunji Guru, Ninya Yidadu. My respects also to all elders from other nations here today. Nyambri Nanawu Mayini, Gayambanya, Ninyoga, Nurumbungu. Nyambri Nanawu people welcome you to country. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our ancestors, our elders past and present for laying a strong foundation for the younger generation to move forward. My name is Paul House, I'm a Nyamri, Walgaloo, Wallabaloo and Nunnawal custodian of site, story and country. The name Canberra is derived from the name of our ancestral group and people, the Nyambri, and was gazetted in 1834 as Canberra Station at Acton Peninsula. I also acknowledge my other multiple Aboriginal ancestries, including the Pajong, Gundungara speakers, 
Walla Walla and Ngunnawal speakers and also Wiradjuri, Marama, Arambi speakers. This welcome to country is made in the spirit of peace and a desire for harmony with all peoples of the modern ACT and surrounds. With this welcome to country, our main aim as local custodians is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post history of this region. As local custodians, we warmly welcome you to our ancestral country and to the special respect of all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples now living on our ancestral lands. As a younger generation Yambri, I have great responsibility to lead my family, my children. I'd like to see our children grow up in a society that honours, respects and acknowledges the Indigenous people of this country. Our cultural identity and connection to country keeps us strong. From our ancestral lands, we believe we are entitled to a greater share in the wealth and prosperity of this country. Our people through law and custom hold cultural knowledge, continue our cultural connection in contemporary society. We continue to maintain a deep respect for our ancestral country, belief system, law and responsibilities. We continue to respect our obligations to protect and conserve our culture and heritage and care for our ancestral lands and country. Our totems are the mullein, the eagle hawk, and the Yukonbrak, the crow. We have cared for our mother earth since the dawn of time. Evidence of our occupation can be seen right throughout the country. Our signature is in the land, not just our DNA. Taking care of country is important to us. The more we look after country, the more it looks after us. Look after your mother country so she can take care of you. The land, the plants, the animals, mountains and rivers, they're all connected not just environmentally, but also spiritually. We must always remember under the concrete and steel of these towns, country, towns, cities across the, the land, there was a rich indigenous history. 60,000 years, over 60,000 years of indigenous history in, in this country, which is now a shared history that belongs to all of us. And in time, inequality, social and econo economic justice will hopefully be a reality. With this welcome to country, we respect the law, of the law of the land. And the law of the land says the following things. You must respect and honour all people in all parts of the country. Give honour, be respectful, be polite, be gentle and patient with all. Then people will respect you. Hold fast to each other, empower the people, respect everything living and growing. Please look after the land and the rivers and the land and the rivers will look after you. In the spirit of peace and reconciliation, Yalanga, welcome. Thanks very much, Paul, for your welcome to country. I would like now to introduce Diane Herriot, Acting Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services, and Diane will officially welcome us to the parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is both my privilege and my immense pleasure to welcome you all to Parliament House. I extend a special welcome to Louise Doyle and her colleagues from the National Archives. I welcome Drew Clark, Drew Clark Secretary of the Department of Communications, Daryl Carp, Director of the Museum of Australian Democracy, Danny Wickman, Director of the Territory Records Office, and of course, our distinguished panelists, whom Louise will introduce individually. And most particularly, I thank Paul House for his warm welcome to country. Today's event marks Constitution Day, celebrating the date on which so many years ago, Queen Victoria gave assent to the act that established the Australian Constitution. This year also marks a more distant anniversary, that of King John's Magna Carta. But the history of this country is an ancient one, and the theme of NAIDOC Week 2015 resonates strongly. We all stand on sacred ground, learn, respect and celebrate. For many generations before the Federal Capital Territory as it was then was proclaimed, this area, including the hill upon which Parliament House is built, was a gathering place for Indigenous peoples. And so I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and to the life of the region. 
Since 1988, Parliament House has been the meeting place of the Parliament of Australia. It is, as then Prime Minister Bob Hawke remarked at the opening, a building for the entire Australian community and an enduring statement of our nation's profound commitment to the principles and practice of democratic government. This great hall where we are gathered is a place of encounter, of ceremony and of discussion. The Great Hall is, in the symbolism of this building's design, a room of the land. Its design, including its monumental tapestry, mark this as an Australian place of the past and of the present, pointing to the ongoing importance of this land in generating and shaping many of the values which have characterised and shaped our country's development. And I cite there um, MG, MGT architect's report um, on the conceptual basis of our art program in the House. The Great Hall has provided the setting for ceremonial functions, for hosting state and visiting, visiting dignitaries, and for a variety of political, community and social events. This year, it has hosted a rich variety of events and forums to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. Being the custodian of one of the four remaining 1297 Magna Carta manuscripts and the only one in the Southern Hemisphere, small ad there, it was appropriate for the People's House to be the, benefit, be, to be the venue for celebrations and spirited conversations. I congratulate the National Archives for bringing together such a distinguished panel for this event. The Great Hall has been and is the ideal venue for such community discussions. The presiding officers, and the staff of Parliament House are very pleased to be able to support this forum to further these community conversations again this year. I welcome also, in closing, the broader community who will be joining us via watching via webcast or broadcast or tweeting tonight. Clearly now, there are no boundaries for the Great Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for your welcome tonight. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Louise Doyle, the Assistant Director General of the National Archives of Australia, uh, on behalf of the Director General, David Fricker. Thanks, Paul. And thank you, Paul House, for your welcome, your very warm welcome to country, and to Diane for welcoming us to this great hall this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to add to Diane's welcome to you to our annual Constitution Day Speakers Forum for 2015. And as Paul Barclay mentioned, on behalf of David Fricker, Director General of the National Archives of Australia, unable to be with us this evening. This is a very special time for all of us. Not only are we here for Constitution Day, we're also meeting during NAIDOC week. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders we have joining us this evening. I extend a special welcome to distinguished guests from the diplomatic corps, business leaders and heads of government agencies and cultural institutions. And also to everyone joining the discussion online via the live web stream and Twitter using the Constitution Day hashtag. Lastly, welcome to our eminent speakers making up our panel this evening. Emeritus Professor Gillian Triggs, Professor Nicholas Cowdery, Dr. Rebecca, Rebecca Ananian Welsh, Neville Tiffin, Pia War, Dr. Nicholas Gruen, who joins us via Skype. He's in London at the moment. And of course, our moderator for this evening, Paul Barclay. We are extremely pleased to be presenting this forum in the Great Hall of Parliament House. It is wonderful to return this forum to the People's Hall, a fitting location to discuss the Magna Carta and our Constitution. And, as Diane stated, it's one of the few locations outside the United Kingdom to hold a copy of the Magna Carta. This year's forum topic, Magna Carta, 
Is it relevant to 21st century Australian democracy is an especially important topic to consider during the 800th anniversary of the sealing of the original Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is claimed to embody the principles and values that underpin the modern parliamentary democracy and legal system in the United Kingdom, the United States of America, and of course here in Australia. Trial by jury, rule by law, representative democracy, no taxation without representation, and an end to the absolute power of kings. Big ideas have flowed from one small page. Sir Gerard Brennan, a former Chief Justice of Australia, has said that the Magna Carta has lived in the hearts and minds of Australian people. And tonight, we will discover how much this 800-year-old document remains relevant to us today. Tonight's forum is just one of the events the National Archives is hosting for Constitution Day. And as Diane said in 1900, Queen Victoria signed her assent to the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act. In doing so, she bound a collection of distinctive British colonies with diverse interests and identities into the nation we are now proud to call Australia. The original Constitutional Act, passed by the British Parliament that same year, is held in the Federation Gallery at the National Archives of Australia and will be shown for special viewings until the 19th of July. The National Archives has a special bond with the Australian Constitution, not only as the original document's custodian. Our role as an archive is primarily to preserve the records of the Commonwealth powers that were established by the Constitution, to hold the memory of the nation for future generations. This is the ninth year the National Archives has marked Constitution Day with a series of special events. Tonight's forum is, our, is part of our ambition to inspire all Australians to learn more about our Constitution and what it means for every one of us in this increasingly complex world. Of course, the National Archives can't shoulder such a task alone, and we're delighted to have, a cons to have Constitution Day partners the Department of Parliamentary Services and ABC Radio National's Big Ideas, who are here tonight, of course, recording the event. I wish to acknowledge the staff from our partner organisations and thank all who helped make this event happen. Through this process, we have forged an even stronger partnership with the Department of Parliamentary Services. Thank you, Diane. And we are delighted to continue our ongoing relationship with the ABC. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the presiding officers for their support, making this an official parliamentary event. Please enjoy the forum, and I look forward to hearing your questions later and reading the online discussion around the Archives Constitution Day blog and Twitter. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Paul Barclay our moderator for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. And thanks for that background on Constitution Day as well. Before we launch into the discussion this evening, we have uh, one more matter. I'd love you to uh, welcome to the stage Shortus and Simpson, a Canberra institution, as they perform the first song from their wonderfully topical show, A Strong Constitution. In uh, true Shortus and Simpson style, a strong constitution is informative, entertaining, funny and poignant as our musical duo explores the language, stories, cases and implications of the work of our founding fathers. Over to you. What's 
there was a sparkle in the darkest southern skies. That sparkle soon became a twinkle in our founding father's eyes. That twinkle grew into a newborn with so many guiding hands. Now here we are together, walking over many shifting sands. We sing this song of a strong constitution. Can we go wrong with a strong constitution? So here we have a framework for our founding federal ways. A carefully crafted benchmark for our parliamentary days. Mark for the separation, separation of the powers. Now we can place a bookmark as we turn each page to show it's ours. We sing this song of a strong constitution. Can we go wrong with a strong constitution? We're actually doing a show called A Strong Constitution at the National Archives this weekend where we attempt to turn parts of the Australian Constitution's very poetic language into song. And what better time to be looking at our Constitution when right now in Australia there are three really relevant debates happening. Recognition of our Indigenous people, marriage equality and stripping away of citizenship without a court case. We sing this song with a strong constitution. We can't go wrong with a strong constitution. A big thank you to uh, Moya Simpson and John Shortus turning the Australian Constitution into <coughs> song. There can be far fewer bigger challenges than that. <laughs> well done. Uh, we now turn to the serious part of the evening where uh, the panel that we have with us this evening raises uh, awareness, I suppose, of some of the constitutional issues. And as you know, we are focusing on uh, the Magna Carta in honour of its 800th anniversary. Um, our panellists tonight, I'll introduce you to them, and we'll start from uh, your left, which is right down there. I can almost see her. Um, Emeritus Professor Gillian Triggs is the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Gillian is at the end. Next to her is Professor Nicholas Cowdery, QC, AM, board director of the Rule of Law Institute and chair of the Magna Carta Committee. Next to Nick is uh, Dr. Rebecca uh, Ananian Welsh, lecturer at the TC Ban School of Law at the University of Queensland. Next to Rebecca, Nigel Tiffin, Board Director of Transparency International Australia. And next to Neville, indeed, next to me as well, Thea War, GovHack leader. And I am very much hoping, joining us via Skype from the UK, Dr. Nicholas Gruen. Chair of Open Knowledge Foundation Australia and CEO of Lateral Economics. Hopefully we can see Nick on the screen, and we can indeed. Uh, will you please welcome all of our guests this evening? Uh, Nick Cowdery, to you first of all, uh, my radio station RN has been taking a substantial look at Magna Carta uh, throughout the anniversary year and it's apparent that there is much mythology surrounding Magna Carta and indeed its history is not a glamorous nor triumphant one. Um, Magna Carta may have come to embody broadly the fundamentals of good government and public administration and the attendant uh, features thereof, but in fact far more is claimed of Magna Carta than it is responsible for. I thought you could start off by setting us straight. Nick? Well, thank you, Paul, and just for a little bit of history, not too much tonight. Uh, if we're celebrating a document by the name of Magna Carta, we are here two years too early. 
The document that was sealed on the 15th of June 1215 was actually the Charter of Liberties. That was the name of it, Charta Libertatum in Latin. It was in existence for nine weeks. So we're celebrating something that was born and died within a period of a couple of months. What are we doing here? <laughs> but in 1216, the bad King John, you remember the nursery rhyme or the, the poem by A. A. Milne, King John was not a good man, he had his wicked ways, and people wouldn't talk to him for days and days and days. <laughs> And in 1216, he died, and his son Henry, who was nine years old at that time, acceded to the throne under the regency of a man named William Marshall, a very capable gentleman. And he decided that the document of 1215 would be reissued. So in 1216, the, what we will continue to call the Magna Carta, was reissued, but in a very much shortened form. The 1215 document was later divided up into 63 chapters. The 1216 document was 40 chapters. All the chapters that imposed too much of a burden on the king were taken out. The king was looking after himself, or William Marshall was. And then in 1217, when Henry III was able to apply his own seal to the document, it was issued again, and this time it was up to 43 chapters. Put a few more concessions back in for the people. And so it went on right through the 13th century. 1225 was the definitive document, but it didn't become law in England until 1297, when the 1225 version was proclaimed again by Edward I. So we are really dating the Magna Carta from 1217. Why? Because at the same time as the 1217 document was issued, a forest charter was issued. And the forest charter was smaller than the other charter. So to distinguish between the two, they call the other charter the Magna Carta, the big charter had nothing to do with the significance or the consequence of its contents. It was because it was a bit bigger than the Forest Charter. So that's one of the myths that was actually begun in the 17th century by Sir Edward Cook, when the revival of the Magna Carta really occurred. But the 1225 and the 1297, which became law, were right down to 37 chapters. So we'd gone from 63 chapters in 1215 down to 37 chapters in the 1297 version that became a statute of England. For Australia's purposes, we have only one chapter in force in New South Wales, chapter 29 from 1297. I'm told, although I haven't checked it myself, that the whole of Magna Carta is the law in the Australian Capital Territory, so look out for some law enforcement uh, expansions <laughs> there. But what happened with this document was that it's not so much the wording of it that's important. It's what people have attributed to it. It's, as you mentioned, Paul, in the introduction, the myth of Magna Carta, which has become important to us and important to all those other jurisdictions who over the centuries uh, have adopted it as a talisman. And so there are some lessons that are learned from it. To answer the question that's been posed for tonight, I think the answer is yes, but it's not relevant in the way that a lot of people think it is relevant to democracy in Australia in the 21st century. What do we take from it now? And perhaps I can finish this burst by giving you a few things that we can trace back to the Magna Carta and which are still important for us in the 21st century. The idea of the continuation of basic law, of the foundation of law on which other laws are built. Because in 1215, the Charter of Liberties was not declaring much that was very new. It was a reaffirmation of the laws of England being reinforced because King John had been ignoring them and the time had come to make him comply with the law. It is representative of the triumph of liberties over tyranny. 
and the limits on the powers of the monarch. That definitely comes from Magna Carta and the whole idea of the rule of law itself. The idea that the law is certain, that it's ascertainable, and that everybody, even the highest, even the monarch, is bound by the law. That is probably the most significant thing that comes from it. But we get some other things too. The independence and professional competence of the judiciary from the 1215 document and successive documents. Equality before the law and due process without corruption in the legal process. No taxation without representation, the catch cry of American independence. That comes from the Magna Carta, and that's the reason why it is so significant in American tradition and, dare I say it, folklore. Two others, the right to property and to compensation for its seizure. And that is reflected precisely in Article 5131 of the Australian Constitution. Fair compensation for the loss of property. And finally, and to a lawyer, a very important provision, freedom from arbitrary punishment and proportionality in sentencing. Even in 1215, they understood how bad mandatory sentences were. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Uh, Gillian Triggs, if an essential legacy of Magna Carta is the commitment to rule of law, then I suppose the question is how well are we honouring that legacy today in Australia? Well, I think uh, I completely agree, of course, that the, it's been what the Magna Carta means rather than what it might technically say. Mm. But it's a very practical document and it, it actually says a lot, uh, much of which I love to use when I'm talking about human rights in the, in the 21st century. But I think the, the most powerful idea that has remained with us is that the sovereign, or in modern parlance, the executive government, is not above the law, it is subject to the law. And throughout the Magna Carta and the language of the Magna Carta is the idea that the council will be summoned, the 25 barons will be summoned, and that uh, the matters of inheritance and taxes uh, and obligations will all be subject to uh, determination and to the law. And I think that that's the idea of the executive uh, government being subject to the judiciary and subject to parliament that are the key ideas that, that actually remain ideas that we need to be alert to today because um, indeed as, our, uh, as the song has, has told us, um, there are many respects in which modern legislation is being passed through this parliament uh, that uh, in many respects uh, enlarges executive discretion and fails to understand the key importance of modern democracy, which is the role of parliament, but very particularly the role of, judi of the judiciary. And so those ideas are ones which have uh, remain of absolutely vital importance to the way in which our democratic system works. And one of the things I've learned in my position uh, with the Human Rights Commission is that it's the ideas that matter. It's not the technical detail of the law, and it's not even grand phrases like um, a, a judicial separation of powers. It's, it's the idea that we are all subject to the law, and that idea uh, does come to a very significant degree from bad King John and the barons and that uh, uh, sealing of this remarkable document on these soggy grounds of Runnymede in, in 1215. We live, of course, in an era of expanding executive power at the expense of the judiciary and the parliament. Is the, and we will say that we're celebrating the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta for the purposes of argument. Um, uh, is it a reminder of the danger of power not checked by rule of law and by the judiciary? Yes, and, and in, that is the lesson, and that is in simple language that we all understand, that we have a democratic system that has an executive, we have a parliament, and we have a judiciary. And they, they are checks and balances on each other, along with, of course, the community and the Australian view. Those are the checks and balances. 
but I think what's happened in a 21st century democracy in Australia is that we've had an imbalance of emphasis on government, the government of the day, and that government has, in various ways, uh, through Parliament, sadly, which in many respects has let us down in failing to support the liberties that were fought for over the decades and over the centuries, uh, but we've lost a sense of how those balances actually work. And that is, I think, extremely dangerous for contemporary democracy. We will come back and talk to the issue of uh, human rights and perhaps how human rights are being uh, compromised by the overreach of executive power a little later on. But Rebecca, if I can come to you now, we are all gathered here at Parliament House to uh, commemorate the day that the Australian Constitution was given royal assent, as well as honouring the 800 years since Magna Carta. What is the relationship between the Australian Constitution and Magna Carta? Is there any direct relationship between the two? When I first looked at the Magna Carta, the first thing that struck me about it was that it is what we'd call today a Human Rights Act. Um, chapter one gives liberties to the people in, in no uncertain terms. And Australia, as I'm sure um, many of you know, is the only Western democracy that lacks a national bill or charter of rights, uh, which makes our constitution at first glance look very, very different to the Magna Carta, and you could be forgiven for thinking they live in completely different spaces. But there's one part of our constitution um, that very closely picks up on a central notion in the Magna Carta, and that's this idea of separation of powers and an independent judiciary. Um, chapter three of our constitution deals with the judiciary, and it's been interpreted to give Australia, at least at federal level, the strictest possible separation of judicial power. Uh, so we have extremely robust protections for judicial independence in this country. What that's led to is uh, talk over the decades of chapter three of the constitution, perhaps being an implied bill of rights, or at least an implied due process principle. Um, so in that way, we see the spirit of the Magna Carta kind of living on perhaps through chapter three of the constitution. Given that Magna Carta is essentially a grand charter of certain rights, does it make the case for a, a bill or a charter of rights for Australia, seeing as we're talking about it now 800 years down the track? Or do we, or do we have in place already the basic democratic processes and rule of law? Are we honouring the Magna Carta in that way, or do we need to go that, that next step in enshrining rights in a charter? I think it would be... Uh a very long bow to draw indeed to say <laughs> that a document from 800 years ago with the kinds of things that were going on then should provide the model for a Human Rights Act today. Uh, what it does do is, which has already been spoken to, is it uh, demonstrates a fear of tyranny and the problem with tyranny and just the need for checks and balances. Human rights language has developed a long way since, since 800 years ago. But what do we have today, which is the second part of your question, uh, and do we have the rule of law in place in Australia? If you'd have asked me that uh, 10 years ago when I first started tinkering in this area, I would have been very optimistic. Uh, and certainly in the 90s, the High Court was taking quite a lot of steps into implying rights into the Constitution. That's where we saw the birth of the implied freedom of political communication. Um, a stronger separation of powers in the states, so protection for judicial independence in the states, which didn't exist before 1996 out of the constitution. Um, but in recent years, we've seen a growth of executive power, and I think the High Court sending a very clear and repetitive message that chapter three of the constitution is no implied bill of rights. Mm. So we've seen uh, indefinite detention upheld by the High Court, both of citizens and non-citizens. We've seen secret evidence upheld by the High Court, ex parte hearings, uh, the bikey laws that we're seeing and, and whittling away of the right to silence, all things that are passing constitutional muster. But in these judgments, if you read them closely, the justices of the High Court aren't saying they're good laws. Uh, in fact, often they're saying these laws are antithetical to common law uh, values, if not rights and freedoms, but certainly common law values. 
but all we've got is this institutional separation and it doesn't say anything about fairness and it doesn't say anything about rights. They are saying that their hands are tied. They are, yeah. Uh, Julian. I, if I could just give an example, because I, I do completely agree, but, but perhaps going back, because you asked the question about whether we've lived up to the standard of the Magna Carta, mm. and can I, from the 2012 version, <laughs> just read a, a quick a, a bit. No free man shall be arrested or imprisoned or outlawed or exiled without the lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land. Now, we have no uh, law in Australia against the arbitrary detention on the whim of a minister of somebody uh, in detention, obviously asylum seekers and refugees, but also all of those who are declared uh, mentally ill and unable to uh, plead their case can be held for years and years at executive discretion. So I think there is a case to be made that we are a long way from meeting many of the either strict language of the Magna Carta, whichever version you're looking at, or the aspirations and ideas of the Magna Carta. And we don't have sufficient judicial review to temper that executive power to detain? Well, the, the very great difficulty um, is that legislation is passed with such precision, precision today that when the courts are asked to judicially review, for example, a minister's act of discretion, that discretion will typically be uh, that the minister can exercise the discretion as uh, they deem appropriate, as, for example, is proposed under the new legislation to strip citizenship. Now, if the um, legislation is very clear and says that the minister has that discretionary power, although it's technically subject to judicial review, when a court looks at it, the court says, well, I, the court must look at the precise language of the law, and if the law gives the minister the power to decide on his or her own uh, subjective view, then there's nothing the courts can do. Mm. So the idea of a judicial review seems to be a very grand idea and one that appears to calm our concerns. But when you look at what's actually happening uh, and what will actually happen before the courts, the court's hands are effectively tied and I, I completely agree with, with the analysis that we've heard. Uh, Neville, if I can bring you into the discussion, you have a copy of Magna Carta on your study wall at home, which I is do. very impressive. Uh, what does it signify to you, someone whose principal concern is around matters of government accountability and transparency? Well, I, I, I must admit I do have a uh, copy of the Magna Carta on my study wall. I did take it down a couple of years ago. And, uh, you win the award, by the way, as the biggest Magna Carta nerd on the, uh, on the I, stage. Look, I accept yeah, that. And, oh, OK. And, I, and even now, when I visit London, I will often pop into the British Library just to look at the, the Magna Carta. <laughs> so uh, I saw the first one at Salisbury Cathedral on my very first trip to, uh, to, to England many years ago. And it, it, we've, we've heard about what Magna Carta actually said and more the, to the point what it didn't say such as right to a jury trial that Nick and I were talking about before. But, the, um, but it is a symbol, and it is a symbol that executive government can be and should be checked. And, uh, and that's really important. Accountability of executive government is, goes to the very core of democracy. And unfortunately these days, I, I'm sure everyone was disappointed with the level of quote unquote debate about recent legislation. The, the standard of debate, of political debate in this country has really declined and it's declined as the checks on executive power have also declined. And when, when, it, when a government minister makes headlines for saying we should listen to co contrary views, you sort of wonder <laughs> where have we reached in this country? And, uh, and, um, and I think if Magna Carta has, is a symbol of anything, it is that executive government needs to have checks and balances. And in the area of government accountability, where should we be most concerned? What areas of opaqueness and lack of accountability are you most concerned about? Well, where to start there? I mean, it's sort of, um, unfortunately, I don't think we have a human right to uh, having government conducted with integrity. Um, I, I think that would perhaps be a good place to start a consideration. But the, um, the lack of proper anti-corruption agencies throughout uh, Australia, particularly at the federal level, is, is a major concern. Mm. It's, um, 
the lack of proper laws dealing with political donations is a major concern. I'm actually on an OECD panel at the moment uh, looking at ways of uh, lifting uh, OECD's efforts on integrity and anti-corruption. And one of the many things that we've identified that we should look at is political financing in democracies. And, uh, and I'm afraid uh, in Australia, we have very few laws that uh, properly address that question. Mm. And therefore, we are not uh, able to say whether laws are being passed for the best principles. Mm. Let me say once again to those in the audience, feel free to tweet some questions through, or indeed those listening and watching via tonight's webcast. We'd love to get your questions, and we will come to them a little bit later on. Actually. Um, there's an interesting blog piece from uh, Neville on the uh, Constitution Day website of the National Archives where uh, you mention uh, an IPA study which shows 262 provisions in current Commonwealth legislation that are in breach of uh, fundamental legal rights, um, which seems an, an astonishing number of, uh, of laws that are in breach of some of those principles that we are talking about as being sort of symbolised by Magna Carta. Perhaps we'll talk about some of those in a moment. Uh, Pia, let, let me come to you. Um, and I think uh, Neville touched on this. We know from opinion polls that uh, the public has an extremely low level of trust in politicians today at the very time that we've seen the rise in, ex in executive power. So. Certain politicians have more power unchecked than ever before, yet we, as the public, have less trust in them than ever before. It's a sort of a paradox. Does this indicate that we, that we do not care? Does it indicate that we are relaxed in allowing our, our federal government ministers to make these executive decisions? What, what do you think? Um, okay, so first of all, I actually am going to be both more optimistic and more pessimistic on different aspects than some <laughs> other parts of the panel. Um, so first of all, I think it's always worth remembering that we have, and we do have, one of the most uh, open democratic systems in the world. There are a lot of things that need to be addressed. Um, there are, we have to be diligent and we have to maintain and make sure that things, you know, when, when things start to, to travel down, that we pull them back up. I went to Mongolia recently as an interesting contrast for you, where not only was a, a minister signing declarations of contracts to a company that he was still the chair for, um, mm -hmm. but um, first of all, that was agreed to be appropriate because general normal citizens that care about democracy um, had the opinion that it was um, perfectly reasonable for a politician to recoup the investment they made in getting elected. It's fascinating, <laughs> right? So you, will, you look around the world and there are completely different perspectives. I think it's very easy in modern Australia to look back at the Magna Carta and read it through the lens of a democratic and social libertarian view. And I actually think that, um, to be a little more pessimistic about the Magna Carta, yes, it was good from a limitations and power perspective and from an accountability perspective, certainly given the time, but it also centralised power in a very small number of very powerful people. And indeed, you can inherit a place in the parliament, and I believe still can, in, um, in Britain, um, as opposed to democracy. You know, you were not, there's still a house of lords, you know, people were effectively inherited a position um, of power rather than being elected to that position of power. So I think it's important, the lessons of the Magna Carta are not limited to the positives, but also recognising some of the issues. And I think that modern Australian um, democracy is as influenced by the Magna Carta as it is by the independence movements of the 18th century and the idea that a commoner, us, <laughs> have rights. So it wasn't just you know, the, the barons holding a king to account, it was an individual person having a right to something and a right to participate in the decision making that affects their lives. Uh, so the independence movements and the f suffrage movements of the last couple of centuries have been a big part of what's shaped the culture of our democracy. And, um, and the other aspect, and this is where I get a little bit geeky, I get to be the, the resident geek on the panel, I think, is technology. Inter the internet and the ability to, for a normal person to participate in democracy has completely changed. People care. People enormously care about the decisions in their lives. I think a lot of people feel disempowered, and that's very frustrating, because when you feel disempowered, you are disempowered. But um, people actually have more power to solve the problems in their lives today than they ever did. So in some ways, You've got the executive, you've got the public service, I think is quite often not spoken about. Quite often it's confused with the executive and the public service is a very different thing that I work in actually at the moment. 
And um, the public service has a role in trying to maintain that integrity as well. And, um, and it's an important role that often gets um, sidelined um, by, by different processes. How, how is the internet, though, engaging citizens? How are we seeing a new form of digital citizenship evolving? Yeah, for sure. We have traditionally power, you know, if you think about power as being, um, you, know, you can think of it in different ways. Long time ago, power was who had the biggest sword, then it was who had the biggest purse, then it was who held the most land. Um, I would argue, and this is a fairly new kind of thinking, but um, I would argue that the powers of publishing, the powers of communication and forming collectives, not just locally but globally, um, the power to monitor, you know, we can, we can now monitor our politicians, we can monitor our government, we can monitor companies and organisations, we can even monitor each other, which gets a little creepy, but it's quite exciting. Um, we can enforce a view. Now, enf enforcement is a scary one because traditionally it's been a power has the ability to enforce a law. Well, you, a couple of geeks with computers can enforce a perspective now by, you know, DDoSing or taking down a website of, of Visa or whatever. Now, that's both a good and bad thing, but it's a fundamental shift in power. The final one is property. You know, you, we're actually getting to the point of being able to produce property, perfect replicas of things with 3D printing. These things were always centrally managed, always centrally controlled. And now, for better or for worse, and I argue, broadly speaking, for better, because it creates a far more empowered civic community to engage in democracy, um, those powers are more distributed than they've ever been before. So mm. it's a very exciting time. Neville? Um, and I, look, I agree with a lot you said here, but um, when you say we can monitor uh, politicians, etc., we can monitor what we know about them. If it's not transparent, we can't monitor it. I agree. And, and transparency is absolutely key, which is uh, my background's not at all in government. Part of the reason I came to work in the public service and part of the reason I worked in a political office for a while, even though I hate politics, <laughs> um, is because it gave an opportunity to contribute to trying to make government more transparent, more open. It's not just about open data, it's about open processes, open policy development, open implementation, open reporting. More open government leads to more effective, efficient and um, public serving government. Well, it provides potential for transparency, if not actual transparency. For example, you mentioned, I think you mentioned election funding and uh, election donations. I mean, it is entirely possible to have a real-time website that shows donations as they occur, that lists the donations, who they are from, who they are to. And, you know, you could set the threshold quite low mm. if you wanted to in, in the hundreds or in the, you know, small thousands. So, and you know, the technology provides the opportunity. It's not the technology's fault if politicians aren't taking up that opportunity. And in, a, in the UK, they've actually introduced new legislation where all um, public service expenditure above $100 is captured and published publicly. In Australia, we publish all contracts above 10 grand, um, but that's still a lot of transparency. But, and this is kind of where I want to get to. It's not about government top-down governance anymore. It's about government needs to engage with people to leverage the skills and expertise and time and the natural motivation of citizens to want to contribute to a better society. Um, and it's only that collaborative, multidisciplinary approach which is going to allow us to actually face the new challenges of the 21st century. Okay. I know Rebecca wanted to say something, but I think we really do need to come to Nick Gruen. I'm afraid he may be asleep in London. Uh, it is very late at night. Hello, Nick. Hi there. I'm not asleep. It's early in the morning. Okay. Well, um, it's, it's great for you to join us um, and to put yourself at such inconvenience to join us on this uh, important evening. Um, I think, as we've heard, Australia may have enshrined many of the fundamental features of democracy that Magna Carta has come to symbolise, but how well do you see our democracy and our system of representative government doing in addressing some of the big policy questions we face? I think that uh, you're not feeling as if the system is working all that well at the moment. No, I don't think it works all that well, and if I was to nominate what Magna Carta offers to politics, I'd say the jury. Now, that sounds like a very odd thing because the jury is something we have corralled off into the law, but the jury is a very interesting social institution. It is demonstrably and radically democratic. Um, and it is what I call a cognitive elite. So government, like any other part of our lives, is very complicated. 
and there is a there's, there's a uh, essential cognitive problem with citizens uh, monitoring their government. There is so much going on that it's essentially impossible. And further, the, the human engine, if I can use that word, our motive for doing this, uh, I may shock some people in the audience, but it actually isn't our reason, it is our emotions. It is affect, not reason. I can prove that to you. There, if you were uh, simply ca calculating your own or the community's rational interest, you wouldn't bother voting because your chances of actually changing anything with your single vote are absolutely infinitesimal. And the whole way in which democratic politics works is that the, the demos, the people, surveil their politics and participate in their politics using um, emotion, if you like, engagement, all of the kinds of things that the media uh, target. Uh, they don't give us long lectures on the content of bills because nobody would tune in. So that's the medium by which the people uh, monitor their democracy. And then the work of government has to go on. And as I see it, the capacity for our institutions to carefully deliberate uh, has gone down and down and down. And you mentioned uh, uh, juries, Nick, and it's an interesting example to draw on because juries do provide, as you've pointed out, the time, the space, the resources to deliberate and reflect. The type of deliberation and reflection that arguably doesn't go on via the media when it comes to important policy questions. In fact, juries in criminal trials, frequently you find people who will have a rather strident view about law and order generally, but you put them on a trial with the discipline of being a jury member and the obligation to abide by the rules of the court procedure. And, and actually what, what you find is that they, in fact, make judgments that are almost contradictory to their own nature. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of evidence on this that, that, that the, the, it's, it's hardly surprising that the process of deliberation and consideration generates much more considered views. And so there is a movement around the world to try and build this kind of deliberation into our democracy. It's really only got as far as uh, citizens' juries on particular issues, which are almost invariably uh, have a, an advisory capacity, and then it goes back to the normal system. I would actually like to suggest, at least for thought experiment, uh, going quite a bit further than that. So, P has mentioned the House of Lords. Um, I used to think the House of Lords was a terrible idea, but the House of Lords has a delaying power, not a blocking power. And so people have to take it seriously, but at the end of the day, the House of Commons in the UK has the final say. I think we could have a, um, we could have a chamber of parliament that was chosen by sortition or at random, a, a sort of representative random, so the appropriate number of men and women and people from cities and the country and so on. Um, I think it would be really instructive uh, if they were then given the opportunity to deliberate on the parliamentary uh, notice paper, the, 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 the agenda that parliament goes through and vote on that. It would be, I'd be really interested to know what, uh, if we had 99 people in such a chamber, uh, how many of them would have voted to get rid of carbon pricing mm. and spend our money on a kind of cockamamie scheme to subsidise polluters not to pollute. Uh, there are all sorts, I mean, nuclear power is another one, resource rent tax is another one, and asylum seekers, I don't think that such a body could, I mean, we're, we are so hemmed in by huge dilemmas there that we're never going to get to the right answer, but I think we're going to feel better about ourselves if we do deliberate and try to be decent about this. So, so, disillusion then, so yeah. disillusioned are you, in fact, Nick, that you posit that a randomly selected parliament, um, uh, sort of getting a phone book 
and picking people at random out of the phone book and making sure that they're broadly reflective of the age, gender and regional makeup of Australia might actually yep. be more effective than an elected one. Th th this is a rather radical thought. Uh, well, it, uh, it is, and I'm not actually suggesting that as a practical proposal because um, I believe that we actually, you know, I'm quite grateful for how good our democracy is compared with uh, the way it was both before and after Bad King John signed Magna Carta. <laughs> uh, so I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't be pretty grateful for what we've got compared with the, the course of human history. And there is a, a clear chain of legitimacy to the system we have. But let me take that um, chamber and let me make it a third chamber of parliament or a chamber instead of the Senate. I'd be happy to give it a delaying power of 12 months, like the House of Lords. I'd be happy to do something else. I would be happy to say that if that chamber can achieve a supermajority, say 60% of its members, it can compel a secret ballot of the other chambers. Because what I see in front of me in Australia is a parliament in which 70 or 80 or 90 per cent of the members are actually against some of the things that have been passing through the chamber as we speak. That's a remarkable thing and it's something I think we should ponder deeply. Okay, thanks Nick. Look, I thought we might move through some of the issues on the agenda at the moment and how they intersect with some of the broader sort of philosophical points that have come forward so far. Uh, Gillian Triggs, the government as we know has uh, uh, has put together a bill to revoke the uh, citizenship of Australian dual nationals who fight alongside terrorist groups in the Middle East, in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, Australian citizenship would automatically be forfeited for people who fight with terrorist armies and dual nationals convicted of terrorism offences could also have their citizenship revoked. You were just telling me before that a bill has recently been put forward on this. Perhaps you can clarify uh, what this bill says in terms of what the executive power of the minister is in terms of revoking citizenship and your thoughts about it. Well, we've had a, a public debate, um, experimentally in a sense, by government putting out ideas. But that, um, the discussion paper and those ideas have now been followed in the last few days by a bill uh, which uh, may or may not pass. But what that bill proposes, and it's called the, the Allegiance um, to Australia Bill, that if your allegiance to Australia is seen to have been uh, broken, uh, in particular, of course, by acting in the service um, of a, a, a declared terrorist organisation, by, by automatic operation of law for a dual citizen, and I might add their children, uh, citizenship will be automatically uh, revoked. Now, there is a proposed power that the minister would be able to uh, exempt somebody from that automatic revocation if the minister thought it appropriate to do so. Now, that is a, a huge level of discretionary power for the minister, um, but it also raises all sorts of questions as, how, as to how the automaticity might actually work in practice. Uh, is it going to be that ASIO goes to a mid-level uh, bureaucrat uh, a government official in the Department of Immigration and says, we've had some information about somebody and we believe their allegiance is now no longer clear to the Australian government. Uh, we think they should have their, their citizenship revoked. Uh, presumably that is then advised to the passports office and you wouldn't be able to get on a plane to come back to Australia. Now, there is that provision, but there is also a possibility of judicial review of a decision by the minister if he failed to exempt you from this provision. And this is, um, I think, put out on the basis that we need not be worried. As I said a few moments ago, we needn't be worried because we've always got the courts. But the difficulty here is that the, if the courts were to consider this question, uh, the court could only say, has the minister considered it in his own discretion to be appropriate uh, to exempt or not exempt somebody from the operation, automatic operation of this law. So it's almost something that the courts would be able to make almost no contribution to at all. They wouldn't be able to second guess the minister in short. So judicial review is a very, very cold comfort to somebody who has automatically lost their, their, um, their citizenship. So, so just to clarify this, you are, you are effectively saying that the revoking of citizenship of, of, of Australian dual nationals would occur 
with effectively without any judicial review because exactly. the review is so narrowly defined. Exactly. It will be automatically uh, uh, revoked by operation of law um, and that would happen without any interference by the minister at all and with no effective a judicial review. The, the difficulty here is that we have, going back to the problem of separation of powers, we have a situation in which the government has or was proposing a bill which may or may not be passed by Parliament, uh, but Parliament has, over the last few months in particular, been passing this kind of legislation, and it's been escaping the Australian people's attention. Uh, much of it, I might add, was introduced in the two weeks before last Christmas. Uh, but the legislation continues, and there's, there's a new bill every so many uh, weeks we get another one. And uh, we're not getting the proper level of public engagement with this discussion that I think we ought to. Uh, the, but the difficulty, the key difficulty, is that we have uh, the executive government proposing laws. They are passed by parliament, which is not uh, con being concerned, uh, as it should be in my view, about basic citizenship rights, and uh, the judiciary is for all effective purposes excluded. So we have the executive making the laws and enforcing those laws. Uh, Nick Cowdery, your uh, involvement in matters relating to the separation of powers goes back to the days when you were prosecuting Joe Bjorki Peterson in Queensland. So you've had a number of, uh, I was going to say a number of years, but in fact a number of decades to ruminate on this. Uh, does the citizenship revocation bill as outlined by Gillian Triggs constitute to you a proper separation of powers? No, it doesn't. And I, I endorse everything that Gillian has said. She's put a finger right on the problem of this particular bill. But there are other aspects to this legislation too. Um, it enables, by operation of law, that is a self-executing process without the intervention of anybody, the citizenship to be taken away from people for committing various acts which really don't reflect at all on that person's allegiance to Australia. So they've, they've picked a number of arbitrary things. I mean, one of the, the propositions is that um, it, it can happen if somebody commits the offence of damaging Commonwealth property. Now, you don't even have to be convicted of doing that. So if somebody sprays graffiti on the outside of this building or, or some Commonwealth property somewhere around Australia, a person, in theory, loses their citizenship for that act. Really? Now, this is just casting the net so wide, it becomes ridiculous. Now, perhaps that provision won't survive and won't actually pass into law because other people will have a look at it, and I know lots of people and organisations are making submissions on this bill at the moment, and I hope that they'll be given proper consideration. But we, we do have this difficulty that our government certainly seems to me to be run by the executive. I think we have a, a supine legislature at the moment, and probably have had for some time, and I think that part of the problem stems from the existence of two major political parties. I mean, if I were to stand for Parliament, as some opposition leader in New South Wales once suggested I should, <laughs> as a result of some comments that I'd made, um, I would naively think, well, if I were elected by an electorate where I live and represented those people, I should be able to vote in the interests of those people that I represent. Wouldn't you think that that's sort of part of democracy? But of course you can't. You've got to toe the party line or cross the floor with all sorts of consequences that might come from that. Mm. And I, I think, I'm, heaven forbid, I'm not suggesting that we should have hundreds of micro parties, that would be even worse. But the fact that we have two major blocks of power in our national parliament, talking about that only for the moment, uh, means, I think, that the parliament as a whole is able to be steamrolled uh, and the input that should come from proper democratic discussion and debate on the floor of parliament doesn't come. Uh, mm. Yes, there are some parliamentary committees that have been set up, but um, they can be ignored. They're advisory only. They don't have any powers to, to reject or veto legislation. Uh, and uh, so we don't get much effective benefit there. 
Uh, interesting to hear Nicholas Gruen and his proposal. Well, that's maybe something for discussion. I just take issue with one thing about what he said. I endorse everything that he said about juries, except, sorry, it didn't come from Magna Carta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's in Magna Rebecca, Carta. It's is in this Magna why we need a Charter of Rights to ensure that what we've just discussed, that we do not have executive fiat resulting in people losing their citizenship. Of course, the argument against that is that two houses of parliament duly elected by the Australian people ought to be able to look at a piece of legislation like that and if they don't like it, vote it down or take out the, the nasty bits and pieces. But uh, George has, I think, articulated why he thinks that doesn't quite work that way. You're calling me George again. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> uh, yes, I think it would definitely help um, to have something introduced into the mix that required Parliament to turn its, its collective mind and discussion to the rights of minorities, the rights of, of individuals, and not just what the party is, is compelling them to say. Um, and I'd echo as well what, what Gillian said, that this is actually uh, a point in a much broader trend that's been going on for, for quite a long time. And um, we saw it ramp up post September 11. So Australia, uh, you may know, you may not know, has more anti-terrorism laws than any other country mm. on the planet. Mm. Um, and that's before last year. We've had more laws than any other country on the planet in the anti-terrorism sphere for five odd years now. Um, when the first tranches of those laws were being introduced, the people were more skeptical than they seem to be now. People were demanding that there was inbuilt oversight. Um, they were demanding that the courts were involved. So being part of a terrorist organisation was always a bad thing. But in 2002, that just became a very serious offence, liable to life imprisonment. In 2005, it became something that could have a control, could result in a control order. So all you needed to show was that that person had been associated with a terrorist organisation and then for 12 months, and that's renewable for however long, uh, that person could be subject to all sorts of limits on their liberty, restrictions and obligations, house arrest, curfews, counselling, all sorts of things. But that had to be issued by a court. And in the course of that debate, people seem to be quite insistent or concerned that courts were at least involved. Shoot forward to now, and that same act of being somehow involved in a terrorist organisation, the courts have been completely cut out of it. It's hard to see what kind of oversight exists at all, and yet we're still being sold on the same line of, but being part of terrorist organisations is bad, and so the executive should be able to do whatever it wants. Mm. Um, and here it's just take their citizenship away. Mm. Without these new laws, we still have control orders, we still have preventive detention orders, we still have terrorist offences. We've got a whole tranche of things that we can use that uh, were worrying when they were introduced and I still have concerns about them from a rights perspective, but are certainly more rule of law compliant than what's being proposed now. Uh, Julian Triggs, does, does this constitute significant encroachment on human rights in Australia, well, these I types of laws? Well, I, I, we do believe that they do, and, and uh, I, th I think um, it might be possible to take a particular piece of legislation and say, well, it, pass, it might pass the test of necessary and proportionate to achieve a legitimate outcome. But when you see one piece of legislation followed by another, followed by another, with growing mandatory sentences that Nick's mentioned, the exclusion of the courts for practical purposes, um, uh, and, the, and this raft of laws, uh, that detain people for one reason or another, you're starting to see a pattern where the, where the whole is larger than the sum of its parts. But I wonder if I could also make the observation, and I think Australians often aren't really aware of this, is that we're almost unique, certainly unique amongst comparable legal systems, in that we have very few constitutional protections for our basic rights uh, or human rights, we have no Bill of Rights, and every other common law system in the world has a, has a Bill or Charter of Rights. We have been a wonderful international citizen in negotiating and ratifying treaties, but we don't implement them in domestic law. Uh, we live in a region where there is no 
uh, charter of rights, we have no commission or court of rights regionally, and we've no agreed principles of what we even mean by the rule of law. So it, it, it means that we haven't got the checks and balances uh, in Australia that exist in just about every comparable uh, community, New Zealand, Canada, obviously the United States, the whole of Europe, um, and increasingly other parts of, of Asia that have bills of rights and where you have a language that incorporates uh, fundamental provisions so that when you get to Parliament, the language of Parliament is one that includes fundamental freedoms, whereas in Australia, that language is not part of how we see things. We don't see the laws through a prism of rights, um, and, and we're, we're, we have to work very hard to, uh, to talk about those rights, except, uh, if I can contradict myself, one of the things that's very powerful for, in Australia, and that's why, in fact, we're grateful to be living in Australia, because yeah. most of us have human rights most of the time, yeah. and that is the, the idea of culture and ideas. And that brings us back to the Magna Carta, mm. because it's what Australians expect of their rights that can be so enormously powerful. Mm. So if you ask somebody um, in the shopping mall, do you have a right to freedom of speech, they will, they will say, of course I do. Mm. But there's nothing in our constitution other than an implied right of political communication and very little in legislation other than a particular provision that was already under threat, 18 C and D of the Race Discrimination Act, that actually protects speech. So we live in a world in which the greatest safeguard in Australia is actually our culture and our expectations. Mm. And, and I've, I've, I, I, this word, a fair go, is about as close as to a Bill of Rights as we've <laughs> got in Australia, but we, we know it when we see it and we value it. And I, that's what I sort of cling on to, really. When we're, if we're getting a little too depressed about where we're going with human rights in Australia, I do remind myself that uh, most Australians see themselves as having certain rights, and they'll insist on those rights. Yes. And I think, frankly, now we're getting a, a, a situation now where almost the executive is noticeably going too far. People are talking about it more, and I think we're, we're turning the tide a little, and people are starting to say, this is enough. Pia, you were going to make a comment. Um, just two things. So I think that um, the, the, everything about the, the culture being a, a, an important part of trying to protect our way of life I think is very, very true. Um, but I think that our cultural um, approach to politics and democracy is a little bit lax. So we tend to see democracy as the election. You know, mm -hmm. People prepare for and they vote for and then they kind of set and forget. Um, what we're missing is a culture of democratic governance and a culture of people being involved in the ongoing governance and the ongoing decision making and the policy making and the implementation and holding people to account. There are certainly pockets of the community that do it and obviously there's a lot of pockets in, in different areas of the, of the community that try to participate and play that game but um, it's not actually a cultural norm to engage in politics. You know, People assume that we'll leave politicians to a very particular type of person um, but I would argue that we need more normal people. But the other thing just to um, go back the other thing, just to go back to the point um, before about the types of laws, one of the problems I've seen, and I mean, I'm, I'm in the technical community, I'm in the technology community, and so there's laws that are passed, particularly over the last few years, that have bothered us immensely, the data retention laws, the internet filtering debate that continues to be raised every year or two or three. Um, and what we see is that the, um, the intelligence agencies will say, we need to have more data to protect the nation. There is no evidence that internet filtering or data retention actually improves things. Um, they've always been able to get access to um, metadata on people, but it's been through a judicial process. And so then a law was passed that said the judicial process got dramatically reduced, and so you know it became a lot easier to get access without that level of oversight. And that's really bothered. You know that, that's a, a huge problem, I believe. Um, but you end up getting um, the intelligence agency's perspective being put up on a pedestal. And, not and even if it's adequately challenged, it's, those challenges aren't taken as seriously. And, uh, because it's just, and because it's just a technical thing, and trying to talk to the normal person out there about um, internet filtering or data retention or a lot of these highly technical ideas is very hard. And so you end up with them getting passed by default. So there's not enough engagement, more broadly speaking, and then very technical things get through that have a huge impact on, on normal people's lives without their knowing about it. Mm. Neville, if I can come to yeah. you, we seem to have in Australia at the moment very much a whatever-it-takes mantra in federal politics that clashes with openness and transparency. An example might be, for example, the turning back of asylum seeker boats and asylum seeker detention policy. The government believes and has said that this is in the national interest, it says it's saving lives 
And this may quite possibly be the case, but how do citizens make a judgment about this matter when it's shrouded in secrecy? What, what rights do we as citizens have to know what the government is doing in our name? Well, we should have every right to know, and we don't, unfortunately, hear about. I can't remember the last time I heard a proper debate involving politicians. There just hasn't been one that I can remember. And I think that's a really sad commentary <coughs> of where we've reached uh, in Australia today. I've heard good debates that don't involve politicians discussing many of the issues that we've discussed here tonight. But if, as soon as politicians get involved, it's that whatever it takes attitude. We heard uh, reference to uh, Chief Justice Brennan before, and he, um, he did a lecture some years ago about um, the duties of holding public office and this concept of a public trustee. And he actually said, as soon as uh, holders of public office develop the attitude of whatever it takes, they will not uphold their duties as trustee of that office. And unfortunately, that's where we've got to in this country. And until somehow we can get that public engagement that Gillian referred to, we're going to have bad laws being passed, or at least laws that don't have proper consideration. Well, how then do you hold governments to account to a higher standard than that? Well, you know, we could talk about things like Nick was talking about, but um, I think one yeah. really basic point uh, that we just need to consider is the openness of funding of political parties. And, um, and we've seen quite a bit of press on that just recently. I actually included that in my blog. We need transparency in that. And we, if we don't have transparency in the funding of political parties, we will never know if we are getting laws passed in the best interests of the people. And unfortunately, we don't have those laws in Australia today. And, uh, and if I was a, if, as, as a citizen, I would be demanding that. And yet I don't feel any groundswell on political financing in this country at the moment. We get a few issues every now and again, and then they die away. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't get any groundswell. We, we do have technology available. We should have timely disclosure of uh, political donations and disclosure of the true identity of the donor, um, the beneficial ownership, if it's a company or whatever. We don't have any of that. And there is, I just don't detect a movement amongst the citizenry for that. Nick Gruen, if I can come to you in London, yeah. uh, you see it happen all the time in Australia, a, a pithy one-line zinger that cuts down a policy without really any serious discussion or debate about that policy idea. It's possible in Australia, for example, in the middle of a mining boom to structure a mining tax that raises no money, um, presumably because uh, sectional interests in that area need uh, to be appeased. Uh, ha how do you think we advance debate when, as Neville has said, the, the, the quality of political debate in Australia at the moment is, is not at a sparklingly high level? Well, um, if you think about all of the things that all of the other speakers have said, they've appealed to uh, structures within government, uh, things like uh, bills of rights and so on, and that makes a lot of sense. But the question of how you build a powerful democratic consensus in favour of these things which are often abstract, uh, and, as Pia said, are often technical and difficult for people to understand. A good question for you to ask in what I call our vox pop democracy is how many of the things we've been talking about will turn up on the photoshopped front page of the Daily Telegraph? Um, there is... A, that's what politicians care about, and... I believe I have enough faith in the readers of the Daily Telegraph that if we involved them in careful deliberation about these things, they would come to think pretty similarly to us. Uh, so I think it's very important to try and find mechanisms which aren't just upper middle class mechanisms uh, to engage the whole community in the defence of these incredibly important abstract principles around which we have built democracy. Uh, one other point I'll make is that all of the other structures that 
one might appeal to involve people who are experts who have careers to build. And it's around the careers that you have to build that, um, sorry, I'm getting some echo in my headphones. It's breaking up um, a bit, yes. It's around, it's around those careers that a politician has to build that one, that, that, the, that powerful interests uh, manage to exert their power. So if I'm a backbencher and I want to make a difference to my country, uh, then as uh, Professor Cowdery was saying, you tow the line uh, because one day you want to do something important and big. That's the game of politics. In a system with sortition, uh, in a jury, no one's thinking like that. No one's thinking of their career. They've only really got one thing to think about, which is what's the best job they can do. And when mm. you involve people in this, and I've been quite involved in this sort of stuff, you find that they get a fantastic buzz out of it. They really love being part of our democracy. And our vox pop democracy simply places an election between them and the mechanism of government and says that there you go, you get your chance every three years. Mm. And the way various other parts of our system are working now it's getting more and more toxic. One, one final point. When people have gone through a citizen's jury process on a policy matter, there are, what do you think happens to their opinion of politicians? It goes up. What do you think happens to their opinion of uh, bureaucrats and officials? It goes up. What do you think happens to their opinion of the media? It plummets even further. They turn up and they say, I have been lied to for the sake of entertainment for the last so on. My, my sense of outrage, my sense of entitlement has been milked for all it was worth. <laughs> and, and, we, and, and, and we have to do something about this, I believe. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nick. I, I am uh, aware of the time. It's pressing on and I do want to come to some questions very shortly, but I thought we'd finish up on something that perhaps is showing some signs of promise. There was a spirit of bipartisanship, a rare spirit of bipartisanship at play uh, earlier in the week with both Tony Abbott and Bill Shorten meeting with a group of Indigenous leaders to talk about firming up the referendum on recognising the first Australians in the Constitution. Um, are we getting anywhere with this? Um, Gillian Triggs, perhaps you'd like to comment on whether you think we are making some, some progress in this area? Well, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think to see this uh, a bipartisan proposal that we now engage in a, an, a, a nationwide discussion uh, for the indigenous peoples uh, to uh, think through what they see as the core uh, values and things they would like to see, uh, and for the Australian public to be engaged in a series of conferences around, around the country. I think the idea is great, and I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this is actually going to work in practice, but it, it, it might be a very invigorating opportunity for Australia to have an informed and balanced discussion about how we would like to see uh, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders recognised in our constitution in a way that um, respects a minority group, admittedly, mm. but our First Nations peoples, but which keeps our basic constitutional structure intact. These processes are very slow, aren't they? I had uh, one of these Constitution Day debates, I think it was three years ago, when we were talking about this issue and it seemed imminent that a question was being put together that could be put to mm. the Australian public, but uh, here we are now. Uh, anyone else like to comment on how they feel that, that this process is going or whether they appear? Um, actually, just a slightly related point. Yep. Um, I think it's worth remembering again to not be too shiny-eyed about the Magna Carta because the perspective of whose rights would be respected back then was quite different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think we've come a, a long, long way and that's a very exciting part of modern, uh, the modern landscape that um, we should all be proud of. Um, and I, I think also it, you know, there's a big community movement behind this as well. Yeah. And, um, and that's part of the um, exciting part, and for me the optimistic part, is that people can and are increasingly, I think, choosing to try to engage. Um, but, um, you know, but, but there's a lot of work in trying to remind people that they do have a lot more power than maybe they think to try to change and influence policy. So, um, 
it, it'll be very, very good to see, you know, it, it's been very good to see additional support for this, but um, I think we need to reflect on, the, it's a huge amount of progress that we've made since some of these early days that we, we try to, you know, sometimes be maybe put on a bit of a pedestal. Mm. Yeah. Okay, look, uh, I'd like to take some questions and comments from the audience, and I've already seen many hands shoot up. The woman right in front of me there uh, seems to have been the first hand to have been put up. So if we could uh, get a microphone to her first of all, that would be terrific. And looks like we have got one right now. And can I just say, uh, and I always say this, uh, please keep your questions concise and to the point. Thank you. Um, hello. Hi, Nick. Um, my question is uh, in regard to whether education at school about the ideals and symbols of the Magna Carta and vox pop processes within schools and so on to test what's going on could help. Now, I will disobey your instructions and say, when I was 11, I went to Runnymede and um, I guess I was told the, the, the story about it and it's lived with me ever since. A month before, I was living in Germany at the time at a German high school. My father was at the Australian Embassy in Bonn. I had been taken, as all school children at uh, high schools in Germany, compulsorily to see a film about what the Nazis had done to people in concentration camps. Those two things stayed with me. And um, I guess, at a fairly young age, I was able, perhaps, to think a little bit about what was going on when I was growing up and then became a voter and so on and testing some of the ideas that I got about things from those two experiences as to what's going on. And of course, I'm very disappointed at the moment with uh, the current system in Australia, which you as a panel have described so uh, very well for all of us, it's disappointing. So I wonder whether you think um, at that sort of age or maybe a little older or younger um, to inspire us uh, and mm. to keep us uh, perhaps with a cultural idea of fair go, um, to test. Thanks very much. The role of education. Um, Nick, perhaps you would like to comment? No? Gillian? Well, I'm very happy to. That's a marvellous question yeah. because, of course, one of our important roles with the Australian uh, Human Rights Commission is education. And it's a point, actually, that I think we may, may easily have come up uh, in the panel because one of the things that's so disappointing, and I think that's partly why Parliament is not playing its proper role now, is that Australians are not really well informed about our constitution, um, and they don't understand these concepts, and they're not educated about them at school. If you compare that with the Americans, uh, you know, an eight-year-old child can tell you about the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment, which has just, of course, been the basis for uh, marriage equality in the United States and the Supreme Court. Um, so the, the answer is yes, everything rests with education. And uh, if I can put in a little bit of plug for the Commission, we've just produced a four and a half minute uh, cartoon for schools and for teachers on the Magna Carta that plugs into the curriculum uh, codes uh, that teachers have in year six and, and year 10. So um, w we would love more resources uh, to be able to produce more resources for teachers, because I think, frankly, uh, that's the future. It, it's our young people understanding the basic concepts and, of course, understanding the story of the Magna Carta. I think Nick and Rebecca wanted to make a comment on the role of education. Yeah, can I, I add two things to that? The first is uh, that certainly in New South Wales, the legal studies course in high schools serves a very valuable function in um, instructing, educating students uh, about government, about law, um, and this year they've had a pretty good dose of Magna Carta. Uh, and through the Rule of Law Institute of Australia, uh, a lot of educational programs have been prepared and delivered to schools in New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Victoria, uh, by uh, three full-time education officers that the Institute employs, um, former teachers themselves. So, the, and, and the websites that have been created to instruct and to educate people about the Magna Carta and its legacy um, and its myths uh, have been, uh, I think, a very valuable resource. So, that, so people do create these resources and deliver them 
but we need to expand that. Of course, there are limits to what any organization can do. Um, every year I speak at the annual conference of the Legal Studies Association, the teachers of legal studies, and, and there are usually a couple of hundred teachers <coughs> in the room. Uh, and their enthusiasm for this uh, teaching, for, for teaching these kinds of matters, and the, the detail and the depth into which they go is really very impressive. So it is happening, but perhaps it happens, needs to happen more widely. I'd, um, I'd first second, but as an outsider, what, what Nick said about the work of the Rule of Law Institute and the education officers, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm seeing that at the university level where these students are coming to us already with a great appreciation for what the rule of law means. And the rule of law is hellishly difficult to teach. Um, and here we have 16, 17 year olds who, who understand it. What my answer to your question or my comment in response to your question would be is that um, I think that role uh, of giving young people a real appreciation for the importance of these documents is one of the often overlooked advantages of human rights acts. Um, now, the dialogue models of human rights that we see in AACT in Victoria are often called toothless tigers because they're not, you know, the constitutionally entrenched American bills of rights. And on the other side, we don't really want one of those constitutionally entrenched American bills of rights because we might become America and problems might evolve from that. But if you put all of that um, to one side and just think how important it is for children and young people and citizens of all ages to be able to say, I have a right to X, I have a right to fair process, I have a right to be heard, I have a right. And most people know what the people in America have, you know, they have a right to a phone call and things like that, but we don't have that, or, or not in Queensland, we don't. Um, in the ACT here, you do. Um, because of the Magna Carta. I don't know whether it's because of the Magna Carta, but because of the Charter. Um, and because of, uh, and in Victoria as well. And the effect that that's had on cultural discussions and in both inside government, but also in organisations like the Salvation Army, in schools, in political discussion is, you just can't underestimate that. Um, so often the impact of these acts is at that education and community level, not necessarily playing out in, in the courts, which I think is quite a good thing. Okay, I'll just, if I can just get Pia and Neville to hold their fire, I wouldn't mind getting through some uh, questions in the small amount of time we have left, and perhaps you can jump in. And, well, just very quickly, um, and then we'll take the gentleman down the back who's been waving his hand furiously on, the, on my left, uh, if you can get a microphone to him. Sorry, Pia. Um, the first thing is we, we can't just teach the shiny version of history because that leads to, I think, a dystopic, dystopic view. Um, but the second thing is that we teach history and democracy and politics in a, here are the important documents, here are where the decisions are made, here are the people who do the decisions, and we teach, we actively teach kids to not engage in democracy beyond election day. So let's start to do that culture change of democratic governance in, in getting engaged in the democracy through getting engaged in decision making on a day to day basis, not just a three yearly cycle. I better, I better let you have your say, Neville, otherwise it seems rather unfair. Okay. If you could just be quick. Very brief. So I was at the dinner uh, the other night and I was, I was coming to this event and uh, there was uh, some people who were probably about um, late 20s, early 30s and they said to me, what is Magna Carta? And I thought, mm, that's interesting. And uh, they could not remember being taught magna anything about Magna Carta at school. Quite briefly, if we don't teach history, we are just going to repeat the mistakes of history. And that's probably just my point. And what better place than a National Archives event to say that? OK, our next question. Yeah, my question is to, mainly to Professor Cowdery, but anyone else in the panel who wishes to comment. Uh, hasn't the Magna Carta lost a lot of its impact and even over the years um, the way it's been invoked by opponents of those in power and by reactionaries and reformers alike. I mean, Oliver Cromwell famously referred to the document as the Magna Fata, and uh, <laughs> even but Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela both cited it in their struggles for freedom. And even more recently, the Tea Party in America have used it in the battles against Obamacare. 
So it hasn't, hasn't it become all things to all people and lost its mm. impact? Well, in a, in a way, yes, it has become all things to all people and you only have to look at the way in which unrepresented litigants present themselves in court with their copy of the Magna Carta. <laughs> uh, and magistrates and judges sit there and say, oh, here we go, Magna Carta again. <laughs> right, <clears throat> what's your next point? Um, it, it has been interpreted in different ways in different places for different purposes over the centuries, not just over recent times. Uh, and uh, you, you've, it, it's had an interesting history. It, it was re resuscitated from time to time until about 1340, and then it dropped off the radar, and nothing much happened to it, and it disappeared. And, and kings didn't proclaim it, citizens didn't rely on it. It wasn't really mentioned until Sir Edward Cook in the beginning of the 17th century, the early 1600s, revived it uh, in his battles with royalty at that time and used it uh, as, as a talisman, as a, as a, a, a touchstone uh, to support his idea that even the king was subject to the law. And so he, he gave the Magna Carta a quality that it hadn't enjoyed until that time, and it's been picked up by people ever since. In, in uh, William Blackstone in the 18th century, um, it was taken to the American colonies in the 17th century, Virginia and other colonies. William Penn legislated Magna Carta uh, in, in uh, uh, one of the American colonies, and I think New Jersey, I think. And, um, it, it then became very important to the uh, American independence activists uh, because the, the aspect of it that they seized on was a chapter in the 1215 document which didn't even survive until 1216, which was the no taxation without representation document. Didn't survive in that form anyway. Uh, and um, Paul Revere had Magna Carta engraved on the Liberty Bowl uh, the currency in Massachusetts at the time of the independence movement had Magna Carta on it. It became a, a, a symbol of much that it really couldn't support to the Americans and to other people in other places at other times. So yes, it's a, it, it is a bit of uh, all things to all people, but that's part of the mythological quality that it had. It, 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 it has become a myth of history. And our myths of history are very important to us, sometimes even more important than the reality of the history. And I think we saw a little bit of that mm. uh, when we celebrated the centenary of Anzac and Gallipoli and all the rest mm. of it in April, and people started to probe a bit more deeply, perhaps for the first time, to see what actually did happen. Oh no, I think we prefer the myth, because it means more to us and it has more value to us than picking this thing apart. And I think Magna Carta has really come to that sort of position as well. I'll try and squeeze in one more question. Someone's waving down the back there. It's a, it's will have to be the final question. Um, there have been plenty of tweets, I should add, and they've been appearing on the screen here. Uh, almost no questions, though, and I didn't really see the point in reading out the tweets, seeing as you can see them scrolling through on the screen. And um, but do con keep on contributing to the uh, hashtag. See underscore day 2015 because that can feed on itself and promote further discussion about the issues tonight. Anyway, a very brief final question, please. Historically, prior to the um, Magna Libertatum, uh, if you think about it, the kings ruled dies uh, gratia. Um, tonight we've heard a lot about the um, the very early seminal constitutionalization of individual democratic rights. Do you think that there is a proto um, secularization uh, agenda um, implicit within this very early history of the development of, uh, of individual rights? Um, who wants to have a go at that? You know what? <laughs> I do. Um, Pia, good on you. Okay. I don't think it was actually about religion 
at all. I don't think it was about secularization. I think it was about business. Um, an unstable environment, an unstable king, wars, um, takeovers, you know, um, uh, being jailed without particular reason, you know, independent, uh, international relations being based on personalities, isn't good for business. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the rebel barons had a bunch of reasons, but a big one was because it, um, an unstable environment creates, you know, it is hard to prosper, it's hard to, um, uh, to do well. So I don't think it was about secularization intentionally, although maybe it was, maybe it was the beginning of that to, as, a, as a side effect. Um, but I think it was actually, um, and this is just my interpretation, I'm sure the more eminent um, uh, experts of Magna Carta can correct me, but um, it, to me it appears like it was, it was more about um, business. Well, the other, the, the major party apart from the king to Magna Carta was actually the English church. And mm. chapter one of the 1215 document gives liberties to the church before there is any consideration of liberties to the barons or to the free men of the kingdom. Or to the city. And you've got to remember that Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, was instrumental in the drafting of the document and in getting John to Runnymede. So the, 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 they talk about the liberties of the church. They were really the privileges that the church enjoyed. Mm the freedom from royal control, not liberties in the sense of human rights that we talk about, lists of rights these days. So the church was right up there and it was chapter one and it was before any liberties were given to anybody else in the kingdom. Uh, and um, uh, well, uh, what, what has happened subsequently of course is that some of the words in the original charter have been reinterpreted um, there was a, a, a point made by one of the, uh, what, what do you call somebody who tweets? A twit? A, a, a Twitter. <laughs> oh, sorry. A twit. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't do that sort of thing. So, um, but uh, the, the point was made that I should have a look at chapter 39. Isn't that the source of trial by jury? Well, no because while it talks about judgment of their peers, it's referring only to the free men of the kingdom. And the free men, scholars differ on how many uh, there were, but they were certainly no more than 40% of the population of England at that time, which was around 4 million people. So it wasn't trial by jury in the way that we know trial by jury. That came in 12, or began coming in 1219, and had nothing to do with Magna Carta. I'll let, you, I'll let you have the final word, Gillian. <laughs> well, just to say that, yes, of course, it was a vitally important provision that the Church of England was to be, uh, was to be protected by the, the, Magna Car the, 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 the English Church. But, but also, interestingly, uh, it was a, there was a specific provision which allowed the, the bishops of the church to conduct their own internal political elections, which gave them a, 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 a very particular role uh, and a form of secularization. But I think we have to acknowledge that nine weeks later, um, Pope uh, Innocent III annulled the uh, Magna Carta and supported King John um, uh, in his civil war with the barons, um, which of course he ultimately lost. So uh, I think at that stage, uh, the, the power of Rome was, was supreme. <coughs> Look, we are a couple of minutes over time, but I, I, I did feel like I should give a final word to Nick Gruen, who's been at rather a disadvantage, um, sort of half a planet away. Uh, and uh, Nick Gruen, just wondering whether there were any final comments you'd like to make on your Skype link before we wind up. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, there, there, there is a comment I want to make, and the comment is this, that virtually the whole discussion has conformed to our idea of what I call a purchaser provider, a, a, a consumer uh, producer commodity, uh, excuse me, a consumer producer democracy, where the people, the politicians and all of the apparatus of government are the producers and we every three years get to vote on, uh, on what we think and if we don't like one government, we put another government in. Th that, that is a... That is a, a, a metaphor of government which is leading us down some very dangerous and dark paths, in my opinion. And I wanted to end up <coughs> with reading you the Athenian Oath. And the Athenian I Oath speaks of... It's not a long of... oath, uh, Nick. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. It isn't. Uh, and it speaks 
to the idea of democracy as a generative commons, something which you, by participating, you build. Here is the oath. We will never bring disgrace on this our city by an act of dishonesty or cowardice. We will fight for the ideals and sacred things of the city, both alone and with many. We will revere and obey the city's laws and we'll do our best to incite a like reverence and respect in those above us who are prone to annul them or set them at naught. We will strive unceasingly to quicken the public sense of civic duty. Thus, in all these ways, we will tr transmit this city not only not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. Uh, that's rather lovely. Thank you very much, Nick, and, uh, and thanks for staying up so late. A hazard to even think what time it is uh, in London right now. Um, look, we are going to round off the evening uh, now with uh, some more music. So I'm pleased to ask Shortus and Simpson to uh, return to the stage for one more song from a strong constitution. Please make them welcome. We're going to wrap this event up with section 71 of the Australian Constitution set to music, plus a little nod to the Magna Carta just to start us off. So we sing this small cantata to the great, the great Magna Carta. Not at all bad for a starter. To the great, the great Magna Carta. To no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse, to no one will we delay right or justice. So we sing this small cantata to the great, the great Magna Carta. Not at all bad for a starter. To the great, the great Magna Carta. And now to the main course, section 71. Where we say hi to the High Court, to the High Court. Yes, we say hi to the High Court of Australia. The judicial power of the Commonwealth shall be vested, vested in a federal Supreme Court to be called the High Court of Australia. And in such, in such are the federal courts as the parliament, as the parliament creates. And in such courts as it invests with federal jurisdiction. So we say hi to the High Court of Australia. The High Court shall consist of a Chief Justice. And so many other justices, no less than two, as the parliament prescribes justice. So we say hi. The judicial power to of the, the commonwealth God, shall be vested, vested in yes, a federal supreme court to be called the High Court of Australia. Yes, we say hi. Thank you very much. Shortus and Simpson. Only in Canberra do we get the Constitution sung to music. Terrific. Um, look, thank you very much for coming along this evening. I want to especially thank our terrific panel of guests tonight. Will you please give them a round of applause for such a great contribution? Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out on a cold Canberra night and for contributing uh, with your questions. The few of you who got a chance to ask the questions this evening has been uh, brought to you by, and I'd like to thank the uh, National Archives of Australia and the Department of Parliamentary Services. As you heard earlier, it's also being recorded for my show, 
big ideas on RN. You'll be able to hear that on Monday week, the 20th of July. There's a comments page attached to that website. We'll try and kick along the tweets in the meantime, but uh, tell your friends who didn't come tonight, they can hear the program, and you can also add your thoughts to uh, our comments page to keep some of these issues that we've talked about tonight uh, going along. Thanks again for coming along. Have a great night, and bye for now.